best. It was my guiding principle when I was in charge of the Royal Opera House, and it's my guiding principle today. And that's why, when I came back to the BBC, I put such a major focus on drama, because great drama is our lifeblood. It helps us define who we are. And we know audiences love it and value it because you tell us that you do. And this year, I'm proud that we've gone from strength to strength. We followed up uh, on Wolf Hall and the Honourable Woman with the Night Manager and War and Peace. And now there's all the excitement that's building around our Christmas schedule, not to mention the new series of Sherlock. But I'm proud of what we're doing across all our genres, reinventing civilization for a new generation to inspire them in the way that I was inspired, reinventing planet Earth. I have to say, and I'm sure anyone who's been watching the extraordinary planet Earth 2 would agree. And by the way, keep an eye out uh, next Sunday for locusts. Um, <laughs> a swarm. <laughs> These are a bit like the race of snakes, but there's a swarm of several billion uh, of them one of the biggest we've ever seen, uh, not to mention a golden mole uh, the size of a ping pong ball pouncing on its prey in the desert. Anyway, it's great stuff this Sunday evening, <laughs> 8 o'clock. That's the only ad this morning, I promise you. But there is nobody who uh, better embodies our commitment to bringing the best to everyone than David Attenborough. He's been doing it for um, more than half the lifetime of the BBC, pushing the boundaries of natural history programme making from black and white, remember that, to colour, to digital, to 3D, HD, 4K, and now he's getting very excited about virtual reality. At the age of 90, he's still pushing those boundaries. And what could be more distinctively BBC than David Attenborough diving a thousand feet uh, in a, I think it was a yellow submarine, um, uh, off the Great Barrier Reef, or hanging in a hot air balloon high above the Alps? And for me, it, it, it sums up what the whole debate about distinctiveness is all about. It's about um, original thinking. It's about risk-taking. It's about creativity. It's about confidence. It's about audiences saying again and again, only the BBC would have done that. And also our creative talent saying only the BBC uh, would have done that. Because audiences recognize distinctiveness when they see it or hear it, and they certainly let you know if they don't think something is distinctive. But they also reward you when you get it right. And I'm sure you know, but in case you don't, um, we have 13 million, or just over 13 million viewers tuning in for the first episode uh, of Planet Earth 2. 13 million. That's a hit of, dare I mention the words, bake-off bake uh, proportions, but it is. And whether it's planet Earth or in our time or strictly, the goal of the BBC is to be of the highest quality, to set the standard, to make sure that everybody has access to the very best. The second important role I, I want to talk about um, is the BBC as a trusted voice in a crowded arena. Increasingly, in a world of infinite information and noise online, where a rumour can travel the globe in the time it takes to type 140 characters, people need to know what and who they can trust. Um, we're told that we've now entered the post-truth era, where presentation can override facts and where it can be hard to separate out truth from conjecture. Um, of course, many of us have been around long enough to recall the halcyon days of the pre-post-truth era, when politicians only ever dealt in facts and never broke promises. Um, <laughs> remember this one? Read my lips, no new taxes. But the real truth is, there has never been a more important time to be able to separate facts from opinion and prediction from certainty. Um, I think our coverage of the EU referendum was a good example. Of course, many had their views on both sides of the debate. Some thought we got it right, some thought we didn't. But this is what public service journalism is always about. There's always going to be uh, a debate. But what we learned uh, from our polls was that people trusted the BBC more than anybody else, and that trust actually got more as the campaign uh, for the referendum uh, went on. And in my view, thinking about that. I think that's because we could offer something um, distinctive and a breadth of coverage that was um, unique. We offered specialist expertise from correspondents on the front line in Westminster, around the UK, across Europe, really important, get the views of what other people are thinking, and the whole of the world. And we offered analysis, uh, fact-checking, that's really important too, from trusted voices like uh, Laura Kunzberg, 
uh, our political editor, or Katya Adler, who's a real star, our Europe editor. Um, and we offered the reality check team online, running the rule over every single claim and counterclaim, trying to separate out the heat from the light. On the day of the referendum, 53 million browsers came to us to see the result online and discover what it meant, 53 million. And it underlined yet again that we're the UK's most trusted source of news by far, and that's a, a, a big trust that we have to live up to. But 58% of the people uh, say they trust us the most, with our closest competitor from any other media company on just 11%, and 58% say they turn to the BBC for accurate coverage, and they are five times more likely to come to our news website to check something is true than go anywhere else. I can always remember uh, when I was working in news last time I was at the, the BBC, during the Gulf War, and uh, another international broadcaster was reporting a chemical attack on Jerusalem. And later it turned out to be, thank God, one of those cases where legitimate sources uh, were wrong. But at the time, I remember sitting and, uh, or standing rather, in the gallery, considering what this meant, what we should do, etc. And Charles Wheeler, that uh, wonderful uh, correspondent, great correspondent, and uh, one of my heroes, came up to me and said, this is what we need to do. I will go on air and say what we know, and let's also tell everybody what we don't know and what is conjecture. It's a very, very simple precept. But is there a more straightforward reminder of the role of the BBC? The British public put a premium on authoritative, impartial news coverage, and that's what we have to live up to, and that's what we're here to provide. But we're not only where the country comes to find out facts, we're also where the country comes to celebrate the big, shared, nationwide events and Olympics, Royal Wedding, Jubilee. And this is the third thing I want to talk about this morning. The role um, the BBC plays in bringing the country together around national issues and national moments. Now, I mentioned Strictly. It's hard to argue uh, that how well celebrities can dance is an important national issue, but you could certainly describe the former Shadow Chancellor doing the salsa on primetime Gangnam style as something of a national moment. <laughs> I'm proud that the BBC is able to produce shows that bring the whole family together on Saturday and Sunday nights, and that still have the whole country talking at school or at work on Monday morning. And the fact we are able to reach more than 95% of the population across all our services means we are also able to inspire big national con 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 conversations, whether about dancing or baking, history or politics, science um, or the arts. At the start of last year, we broadcast a special Democracy Day <coughs> to mark 750 years since Simon de Montfort's first parliament, a turning point for democracy in this country. Awareness of that anniversary shot up overnight from 19% to 34% of adults across the UK. The next day, we aired the first episode of Wolf Hall on BBC Two. Public awareness of Hilary Mantel's novels more than doubled, helping readership to increase by 40%. When the BBC hosted a year of science on air and on screen in, 19, in 2010, it actually led to an increase in the numbers of people applying to study science at university. This is what the BBC can do and the impact we can have. In fact, the latest data we've got tells us something really interesting. I mean, this is really, I, I felt this is a really important statement to us about the impact we can have. Over the last three months, more than 90% of audiences we surveyed say they have learned something from BBC TV. And more than half, more than half, say they've done something different as, as a result of watching. And when the BBC were asked to grade media companies and organizations according to the impact they have on their lives, the BBC came out top, ahead of newspapers, ahead of Facebook, Twitter, ahead of Apple and Google. And that's a responsibility we should take very seriously. And for me, one of the biggest messages we need to take from the charter process is this. We should be even bolder in telling the public about things we think they need to know. That's why we've put so much effort, for example, into our raft of programmes to commemorate the centenary of World War I. Around three quarters of people in the UK consumed some of our content to mark 100 years since the war began in 2014. 
including, and this is interesting, including over half of those in the 16 to 34 age group, the hardest, as we all know, to reach. And far from getting tired of our programme, more than 80% of people remained interested, and half of those who consume BBC content still wanted to know more. It's also why, that sort of data is why, we pulled out all the stops to mark this year the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's death by celebrating his life and work across all our platforms. Our goal was to make Shakespeare accessible and irresistible to everyone of any age as they like it. When I was at school, I had to travel 150 miles to Stratford and stand at the back of the theatre for nine hours to watch three of the Henry plays in succession. Today, it's the latest episode, instalment of The Hollow Crown at the touch of a screen, or a Horrible Histories special on CBBC, or Russell T. Davis's brilliant interpretation of A Midsummer Night's Dream at primetime on BBC One. By the way, Russell T.'s uh, Midsummer Night's Dreams tell you two things about the BBC. One, uh, the dream. He always wanted to direct Midsummer Night's Dream, and we made it happen for him. Since he was a kid in Swansea, he saw Midsummer, that's the first Shakespeare he saw, he always wanted to put it in prime time on BBC One. The second thing is, because he'd been the showrunner for Doctor Who, he also could use all the expertise at Rose Lock, the prosthetics, all of that, to make what was something which was an extraordinary uh, hour and a half uh, of, of, of television. But it's not enough for the BBC, in my view, to offer people access to history or science or the arts. We want them to get involved as well, enable them to take action and to take part. One of my favourite projects um, is called Ten Pieces, and some of you may know about it. It's a programme that we've been running for the past two years to introduce um, another generation of young people to classical music and to encourage them to develop their own creative uh, response. Not just in music, but in art and animation, poetry and dance, movement and composition. And anyone who was there or saw our Ten Pieces prom this summer will be able to testify to how extraordinary their response has been. Watching nearly 500 children from schools right around the country performing the Dies Irae from Verdi's Requiem in the Royal Albert Hall, I can tell you, not much of a dry eye uh, in the house. And one mother wrote to us afterwards to say it was one of her proudest moments of her life and one she'd never forget seeing her child taking part. But we're reaching every school in the country with science too. Many of you will remember the incredible impact that the BBC Micro had back in the 80s on driving computer literacy in this country. Adapted by 85% of secondary schools, with many of today's most influential technological leaders saying it was crucial to their uh, computing careers. So I was very proud in March to launch BBC Micro's little brother or sister, the Microbit. This summer, we gave every child in year seven one of these coding devices. That's up to a million young people all around the country because we want to inspire them to get coding and to develop the future skills the UK needs. It's very ambitious, but then so are the young people who we are giving the Microbit to. Already, one schoolgirl from West Yorkshire has managed to turn hers, her little micro bit, into a temperature sensor and send it right up into the stratosphere, right up in the stratosphere, which is great for her skills. <laughs> Not so great, though, for air traffic services who had to reroute <laughs> aircraft around Nottingham as this micro bit came back to Earth. But it's a perfect example of what the BBC can do when we mobilise others around our mission. We can produce an educational project on an unprecedented scale, conceived and convened by the BBC, and delivered with more than 30 partners. We can bring together organisations like AR, ARM, Barclays, Microsoft, NXP, Samsung, Lancaster University, contributing everything from hardware, software, 